Good evening or good afternoon or whatever time you happen to be watching this and welcome to another episode of Cooking with Bryson, hashtag Hacker's Kitchen. Uh, tonight, I am joined by the inestimable Josh Corman, um, probably best known as one of the co-founders of I Am The Cavalry, but along with all of the other great thought leadership and things that he pushes out into the community. Um, tonight, we will be making his really awesome chowder. I've been looking forward to this all week. Um, logistics, as a reminder, you are welcome to interact with us. Um, hopefully, the Q&A works this time. Uh, <laughs> certainly, we, we, had a, we had an issue last week where um, the GoToWebinar just decided to not take questions or let me answer them. So um, feel free to throw one out uh, just to test it for us. Uh, that'd be great. Um, if that doesn't work, feel free to throw things in the chat. We will do our best to answer everything you've got. Um, I am drinking a Founders All Day IPA to join me tonight. And Josh, the show is yours. I'm drinking a local experiment called Ring King Pineapple IPA from Smut Labs, which is like the experimental part of Smutty Nose Brewery in the New England area. Pineapples, I sense a theme from last week with Krebs. Yeah, but do you have double pineapple like I did last week? Uh, and this is uh, spicy peppers. By uh, the way. You, you are spicy. I think about that every time we hang out. <laughs> I am a pepperhead. <laughs> so, All right, man, what are we doing? So um, I like to cook a lot. Um, I find it to be therapeutic. I don't know how to shut off my brain, so I can just repurpose it. I can't bake it all though, because I'm not good at following the rules or sticking to a recipe. So one of the things I like a lot is chowder, but people don't make it very well. Um, and my kids, uh, my girls didn't like the dairy. It caused them GI problems. So um, I started experimenting. Can I make a chowder that wasn't based on clams because they didn't like seafood and wasn't um, heavy on dairy. So I found a roasted red pepper corn chowder that I loved and every single time I made it I made it a little bit better kind of hack with it and found a way to make it creamy and taste like chowder without any dairy in it. If you do love your dairy you can add heavy cream and other things at certain points but I'm going to show a trick about I don't know halfway through this that can make it quite rich and creamy independent of any actual um, dairy products. Um, so I, I start, I like one pot meals, and this is mostly one pot meal, unless you include the uh, fact that you can use a blender as part of that hack. But um, I started with the roasted red pepper, where you just kind of flame broil some peppers, peel the skin off, dice them up, and you got this nice little smokiness to them. Then later I said, you know, I kind of want some more smoke and some more protein. So I added one of my favorite sausages. It's uh, the New England area has a lot of Portuguese folks in it, in, uh, the Newport area. So one of my best friends in college introduced me to Chirico or Cherise or Shadis, depending on who you're talking to. Uh, it's a nice kind of smoked sausage with chunks of ham and garlic and paprika and whatnot in it. So I decided to render those down. That's the first step we're going to do. I cut that nice sausage into uh, little medallions in the bottom of the hot uh, uh, Dutch oven nice cast iron with enamel for mine. I'll uh, put these at the bottom, get a nice Maillard reaction, that little dark brown, crunchy awesomeness. But I'm also trying to render some fat out that we're going to use to flavor some of the vegetables. So the first step is if well, you hold cut on. up back, the sausage. Josh, if I could jump in back on the, the sausages. I mean, not yeah. everyone can have access to a Portuguese sausage. That's so right. What else, what else would you recommend we use? One of the reasons I like this dish is because I have experimented so much and it holds up pretty well. You can do pretty wild variations. Um, I've tried chorizo. I think that's what uh, you may have chosen today. Um, I found it a little too overpowering for, for me. I, which, by the way, chorizo is my favorite in breakfast burritos. But for this dish, it's a little too much. I also tried andouille sausage, but any sort of smoked sausage will help because the real, the real winner here seems to be the smokiness that comes out of the peppers and it's helped by the sausage and the aromatics that we're going to add to it. Um, more recently, I've added poblanos, so it's roasted red pepper and poblano. And then at one point I said, I like potato and leek soup. Why don't I make, put leeks in this as well? So this thing is changing. I even tried a new experiment today after watching your show last week with Director Krebs of uh, 
DHS CISA. So this might get loud for a second, but I'm going to put my medallions in and start rendering that uh, effect and the fat. Yeah, so um, I uh, was not able to get my hand on Therese, so I am using an El Salvadorian style chorizo. Um, but I think just like uh, any kind of chowder, you really want um, a salty, smoky uh, meat to really bring that, that umami out. So in a pinch, you could use bacon. Um, you want to try something a little bit different, ham. And then certainly, as Josh was talking about, lots of different kinds of sausages to pull out different flavor profiles for what works for you. I love right. that sound. Yum. I love the sound too. It's going to make it hard to talk for a second, but we'll get this stuff out of here pretty soon. Maybe when the sound dies down, I'll tell you the story behind this Lake Crusade. But. Uh, confirmed that Q&A works. Thank you, Keenan. So we are good to go for your questions for me and Josh. So initially I have more sausage than I can fit with the surface area face down. So I'm gonna let it shrink up a little bit because I, I want that surface contact. In fact, this is one of the lessons I had to learn uh, as I got better at cooking. I used to think it was a bad thing if you got a little bit of the brown on the bottom and a little like almost like burny looking. But um, it's really wonderful when you when you get it uh, deglazed up into with the onions and the other aromatics and add some liquid. That's where most of the flavor comes from. So I like the crunch on the meat. I like the rendering of the fat. And what it leaves behind on the bottom is lovely. Um, so I, I've probably been throwing away flavor for most of my early cooking experiments. So the last couple of years, I figured this out. One of the reasons is Bob Rudis, a harbor master on Twitter, he got me into sous vide, you know, the water bath. So I sous vide a lot of meats and they come out really perfectly cooked temperature wise, but they don't have any crisp or color. So I started using my cast iron a lot more to get a really hard sear that Maillard reaction that the brownish blackish, um, you know, tough crunch and bite you can get there. And that's when I started realizing how important a part of a lot of the dishes I make are. got to be hot enough though to get that reaction not so hot that you burn it so I'm not trying to boil that sausage I'm trying to get a nice crust on it um, just uh, something to throw out earlier in the episode so one of the ways that I do leak because um, the hardest part about leak is the way the dirt gets all up inside of it right um, is yes. I actually, I soak my leek in a bowl of water for half an hour, and it's really easy to pull the dirt out. Um, and so when you drain it, the dirt goes right out of it and you get clean leek. It's a lot easier once you cut it and just soak it. So for those of you who want to try that at home, it's something you could do now. I tried to make the joke with the person at the grocery store. I said, there's a leak in that bag. They didn't get it. <laughs> Not everyone appreciates that jokes, Josh, but that doesn't mean you shouldn't keep trying. All right, so I'm flipping over each of these medallions when I think I've got the beginning of a sear. So I want to get that sear on both sides. If this is too big a bite of meat, you can also cut them in half, but um, I find it's easier to flip them and get the surface area. Yeah as medallions and then maybe after they've cooled I might cut them up a little more. You know it's not just uh, hard to find Portuguese sauce it's hard to find anything lately at the store so I've had to get creative with substitutes. Yeah no pretty much every episode there's there's a few things because I'm, I'm always trying to keep up with what every chef is doing every week and um, so I uh, <laughs> it has pushed my culinary experience to the limit to continue to come up with new ways to do different things to accommodate all of the different spectrum of recipes that we're doing. Yeah. But I think that ties really well to kind of a philosophy discussion we were having earlier about the great chefs and how they approach the kitchen and cooking. Yeah, I mean, I, 
to, to frame this, I don't even know what the first moment was, but let's just say the, the moment it was crystallized for me, if, if most of you in the hacker culture have at least heard of Jericho, of the 303 group, or uh, Attrition Org on Twitter, um, he and I did a very long research series during the rise of hacktivism and anonymous called Building a Better Anonymous, and it was kind of risky, and we did not see eye to eye on everything, but we, we both had a really high standard of care for how to write it. So we kind of bonded over that time period. And to wrap up the whole thing, uh, Nick Prococo gave us a keynote at ThoughtCon one year uh, to do a, a kind of an epilogue or you know some sort of after the fact, now what do you think now that you've done the project? So we did a talk on cyber war is upon us, but not what you think. And I talked about asymmetric warfare and non-state actors and the use of social media and propaganda. And we were warning about things like cyber caliphate and the rise of Janet Hussein and Trick, which did eventually happen. We, um, very few people know about that, but a uh, former member of anonymous Team Poison started the cyber caliphate uh, and moved to Raqqa, Syria before killed by a drone strike. So it's some pretty scary stuff when you ask, you know, maybe not the world's best hacker, but what could a script kitty do with Shodan and, and free tools and free attack tools? And the answer is quite a lot. So he and I were like trying to celebrate and commemorate years of collaboration. And we got a restaurant reservation that L2O, Lake to Ocean, which is gone now, but it was like the t number two restaurant in Chicago. And as the, the dishes are being served, we kind of started spotting like these little Easter eggs that almost seemed like a screw you to the rich. This is probably the most expensive meal I'd ever had. Multi-course serving tasting menu. And we started thinking, this guy's screwing with us. Like, they're messing with us. There was like a 26 flavor reduction on like 26, 26. Oh wait, that's uh, Dr. Pepper. So we started asking the sommelier and sure enough, we, we kept finding all these hidden jokes and Easter eggs in the dishes. So I started this theory that, and I think it's proven, proven out that some of the top tier chefs have a, a real kinship with hackers, whether we realize it or not. They like to take things apart, put it back together, reimagine something, do food deception. You know, they're always pushing the limits of what can and should be done. And through that, now whenever I meet a chef or somebody who's been on Top Chef or James Beard type, you know, I strike that up. I think there's just tons of common ground. I would not call myself a top tier chef by any stretch. <laughs> A top tier right. chef is uh, just somebody who wakes up early and spends their whole life doing this. Um, I don't think I could ever do this for a living. Um, yeah. I, I, I like I like cooking on my terms, and I like cooking when I feel like it. Because for me, cooking is very much an emotional feeling thing, and to have to do that on a schedule, it's just like it's like producing art. I can't doesn't 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 interest me. I, lo I love cooking for a lot of people. I really enjoy that. I know how to cook at scale. I know how to lead a kitchen, but uh, I would never want to do it full time. Yeah. Lose its luster. I also just like, you can make a lot of things happen with really cheap, really simple ingredients. And you can go your whole life not really realizing the potential you have. Like, I mean, how many times have you had a red pepper? But like, it really tastes differently once you scorch the bejesus out of it and get the skin off. Uh, it takes on a different characteristic. <laughs> and that alone, you know, might be one flavor, but when you put it together, when I mean, you get a really nice layered dish, that's amazing. Yeah, I, re I regret that we didn't, uh, or you didn't propose the idea to smoke the peppers until the afternoon, because that's something I absolutely want to explore. Yeah, we should talk about that. So I watched your show last week with uh, Director Krabs, and he seemed to, uh, he really planted a seed in my brain here about, I think, what was it, grapeseed tomatoes um, yeah. smoked on the grill with hard Yeah, wood. so we, we smoked um, grape tomatoes, and then after that, you, you toss them with herbs and olive oil. And I can personally attest that after you've done that, if you make a large batch, it keeps for several days. Okay. Um, and I've tried it several different styles because... Um, he first introduced me to it about a month or two ago when he made me um, a personal batch. And uh, I, I used it in several recipes, and it was very versatile. So it was a really neat thing to 
to, it didn't require a lot of effort other than the smoking to do it. And then I had this, you know, awesome tub of stuff in my fridge that kept for a long time because the olive oil, right? He put so much oil with it. It naturally preserved along with the smoke. Um, and it didn't lose its flavor, so I was able to use it in a lot of different things. It was fun. It was really fun to kind of just play with it, having it on hand. Yeah. So Chris, if you're listening, I tried some hardwood. I think I used hickory today to smoke my peppers. I'm not sure they're on there long enough on the on the grill, or if because they're already you know completely intact, if if it really did much. But we'll find out. <laughs> I had a chance to put at least some smoke in the vicinity of it. Why did you, uh, why'd you pick hickory or was that just uh, what was convenient? Um, I had it open in nearby, it was unlabeled. I think the last, the last unlabeled one I had was uh, hickory. It was just a staff decision. Yeah, I've been, I've been experimenting with a lot of different kinds of woods and have started getting a little exotic. So I just find it really curious what people choose. Yeah, I have different favorites for different things. Same guy, Bob Rudis, Harbor Master. He introduced me to slow smoking a, a really thick cut porterhouse steak on the bone and then giving it a really hot flash here at the end. And that one, I think that was best with um, this uh, particular smoke uh, wood chip that was made out of like whiskey barrels or something like that. It had like, a, or at least it was treated with some whiskey after. Um, so they, they, they soak them. So you can get like bourbon soaked oak or that's actually the only kind I've ever seen. Um, but they, they soak the wood chips in bourbon. So I like my, uh, I like cherry wood a lot lately. All right, so I'm taking out the meat. There's a reason I'm taking out the meat. Lots of reasons, actually. One is I don't want to overcook it. But two is after we get everything else going in this the nice rendered fat and the flavor, and we get even get the chowder part going, the soup part going, at some point later, one of the hacks we'll get to is you remove maybe a cup or two, depending on how creamy you want it, from the overall batch with the, the potato. Yep, and you're gonna put it in the blender and you blend it. So then when you have the blended potatoes, which are starchy corn which is starchy the leeks the onions you've got this nice creamy base added back in so you get a bit a mix of creamy bits and uh chunky bits so next i'm going to put in the the onion that i've already chopped and my goal here is to get a happy but um all that stuff that looks kind of burned to the bottom i'm using the because this is an enamel, I don't want to scratch it. I'm using either a wooden spoon or these silicon tip uh, tongs. But I'm trying to kind of scrape this around and get the onions like dirty, coated up with all the, the sediment. Oops, one of the pieces is still there. And I want to cook this pretty quickly too, so my temperature is still pretty hot. Um, if I were to touch the side of this, I'd burn my hand again. Had a burn last week making some uh, sous vide strip steak. You got a splash of hot oil. Ouch. Pretty bad burn. Uh, it's a good thing that, that through the cavalry, I know some uh, doctors who could do some telemedicine for me and tell me how bad the burn was. Last thing I wanted to do was go to the emergency room during uh, a pandemic. So I don't know if you can see this. These onions are. Uh, they're, they're quite orange. Uh, they're taking on some of the red from the sausage and the fat. And this is making me very happy. So now that I'm seeing they're taking on some color and I'm scraping up the bottom bits a little, I haven't deglazed the pan yet, but I'm getting a little bit. Before too much time passes, I'm gonna add the leeks. So Bryson already gave a really good tip, which is they sometimes have dirt in them, so you wanna soak them for a bit. I cut them right down the hemisphere, and then I'll cut them into half circles and I'll do two whole weeks. You definitely toss the bottom and the top greens if you don't want that dirt. But these leeks were kind of a game changer as well. You get some nice uh, aromatics. Also, you get some uh, almost.
almost the same effect you get from making uh, Mirepoix and you know New Orleans dishes, it, but instead of celery, we're using this. I figured it's somewhat in between. It's like the love child of an onion, and celery. So I'll do two of these things, and now I'm going to get those coated in the same oil. Love child, I like that. The love child. All the most interesting things are, you know, calling from multiple places and disciplines, right? Like uh, sometimes when I introduce myself to somebody outside of cybersecurity, they're like, you know, you, you, you talk different than most of the people I know. And I say, well, I'm what you get when you put a philosopher in the hacker culture for 20 years. Um, it's just, it's not your typical entry point into cybersecurity. But I think what it allows me to do is maybe notice things or bring a different school of thought or framework to how you break things down, categorize things, equip things, look, look at social contract theory or ethics or you know public good on a macro scale, maybe instead of defending a single enterprise, how do you look at what society needs from us? So hard to see from a distance, but this is like looking like a almost a dirty coleslaw. I'm getting a lot of the uh, really nice smell off of it. Um, let's kick that smell up a lot. I would like to, I'm going to salt this uh, to get some of the moisture out of the uh, onions and leeks. And I'm not shy with my salt. Maybe that's not healthy, but love it. Um, <laughs> when I subscribe to the theory, you can add salt, but you can't take it away. That's true. That's true. So I, um, I know how much salt I tend to like. The next thing I'm going to add to for the aromatics is a bunch of garlic. Uh, I pre-chopped it just to keep this on track and on time. Uh, whenever I ask my significant other how much garlic we should do, the answer is twice as much as you thought you should, yep. um, at least. So a lot of that oil is now no longer on the bottom of the pan. It's now um, coating the leeks, the onions that are nice and getting glassy and glossy. The salt's gonna pull some water out of both of them. But now that I've added the garlic, I added a little later because I don't want it to burn. But I still, at this point, want that really high heat. And also my significant other has gotten me into gardening a little bit. So I'm gonna use some fresh thyme sprigs right now. Uh, we've taken the leaves off the sprigs. But I think under the high heat for a little while, um, we're gonna want, um, to get some of the oils out of them and crisp them up almost like a fried sage leaf if you've done that. Um, little Easter egg if you can see. I don't know if you can see Bryson. Maybe, maybe a disclosure of a sort. Maybe oh, uh, some that that is a really nice uh, ring. Subtle nonverbal news. Is is that ring of pineapple? But uh, I'm gonna add this delicious thyme. I mean, thyme comes on a spring. I mean, you know this. I think yeah. I had a little bit of lag. Thyme comes on a sprig, so you can kind of just pinch it and pull it, uh, usually against the grain, and they'll come off nice and easily. You can also use, you know, store-bought thyme. Uh, there's never enough thyme. <laughs> Oh, 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 oh wow, that, that time like really hit. What? Never enough time? Yeah. No, but the I smell of the time really hit me. I don't know if you're getting there. Time. So what's your philosophy on garlic? Um, I did double what you recommended. Usually double, yeah. Similar, I'm like, you can always add garlic. It's hard to take it away. You actually get, well, you can't have too much garlic. You can have too much salt, but you can't have too much garlic. It is impossible. I'm, I might agree with you. Like, I literally could not have enough garlic. Like, I could just eat an entire dinner of garlic. Um, in my view, the one, the one church that I subscribe to is that butter, garlic, and onion is the holy trinity. <laughs> yes, yes. Um... All right, so I'm, I'm liking the smells coming off this right now. I haven't even added any pepper. I, you know, keep hearing conflicting information about when you add pepper to things. Um, but I'll usually put a little pepper in now. Yes, it might burn, and I'm going to add a lot more later. 
So now that I'm getting enough fluid released, the, I got a lot of water out of the onion with the salt. So a lot of the stuff that was, you know, might have been looking like it was burned to the bottom is kind of coming up. I haven't even added any broth yet, but I'm able to scrape most of it up. And since I'm liking the way this whole uh, mixture is smelling, I'm probably going to take it to the next stage. <laughs> now, since I can't see the Q&A, have there been any questions about this stage before we complicate things? Nope. I will jump in with Q&A if we need to. Okay. So just a reminder, you all at home, feel free to ask questions. Can't recall. What? We're not doing bad on time. You know, this is uh, some of the soups I make take all day, but this one's pretty quick. Uh, I kind of chose it in parts because I thought we could actually accomplish it within the span of your show. Yeah, no, the, the blending really is the difference. And if you're not trying to render your stock, it's, right. That's really the part where you want it to cook in all day. I make, I make chicken soup from scratch with a carcass. I am, I am, that's an all day commitment. Yeah. So at this point, I'm going to add some stock. I did not make my own chicken stock to this time. We used it for something else. So um, I got two boxes. I'm not probably going to use both. Let me see how full it gets. But I'm going to add a little bit, maybe not even a cup of this uh, chicken broth. And the reason I'm not adding too much yet is this is the point where I'm gonna try to make sure that as I can get all that sediment off the bottom. Cause that could, you know, burn a bit later as we go into the, the more volume um, that will obfuscate it. So this is what essentially- you, easy. Oh, you use Swanson chicken broth? Uh, today I did. <laughs> the grocery stores are different, right? But after uh, Bob kind of taught me how to cook on my own, uh, a little bit more. Um, I waste a lot less stuff now. So if we make a whole chicken, if we can find a whole chicken, you know, we'll use the uh, the bones to make a stock or something. Use the leftover chicken to make a salad or a pot pie or something like that. Uh, I'm fond of if I'm in a hurry making a pizza, flatbread pizza out of leftovers. So I used some leftover chicken the other day on that. And all I'm really doing is deglazing, not even because it wasn't quite hot enough, but um, this is just making sure I got it all off. Yeah, so one thing uh, that's made me have to cook more things and I'd be home a lot more is uh, Right after Bo and I left uh, the public policy think tank, we did a couple years trying to push public policy to the UN and NATO and US policy at the Atlantic Council. Uh, the night before I started my chief security officer role at um, an industrial IoT company, I got a blindside divorce on my 18th wedding anniversary. Like she's like, I'm done. There's nothing you can do about it. I'm not going to counseling. I don't care what happens. <laughs> so that was pretty big shock to the system. And, I, I did a lot less travel. I focused more on food and shelter and making sure my daughters were okay. Um, so that was a pretty big, you know, um, surprise. Uh, after, you know, you think you're being a good husband and provider and dad, and then things don't always go well. And there's good reasons going back 10 years that really aren't anybody's fault. We had, we suffered a tragedy that, you know, kind of changes who you are and they don't always change in the exact same way. You know, I try to use a tragedy to, Prove myself or uh, build more empathy or emotional skills, but we just never quite recovered. So uh, local folks like Bob Brutus were humongous help, um, both on being a sympathetic ear, uh, but also teaching me how to, you know, cook more things and take care of myself better and not just eat the quick, easy junk food. Um, even got me to make some breads, which I am very allergic to baking. I love the results of baking, but I, like I said, I mess it up most of the time. So back to the recipe though, I only did one box so far because I want, I want a large volume here. I'm going to, I think I'm going to go for the full two boxes. Let me see how it, how it goes. Two boxes of what? Oh, the, uh, chicken the broth. broth. I have a pretty big um, Dutch oven from like you say. 
Yeah, I'm gonna do the full two boxes. So now I'm cranking this thing all the way up because I wanna boil it. Because my next step is gonna be to cook the potatoes that are classic for a chowder. And again, there is a story behind Lake Crusade if we get to it. There's a story behind Lake Crusade? Yeah, it was an important turning point. All right, you know what? I actually may want a third. What's going on? Let me add potatoes. I'm gonna add my diced potatoes and see what the volume's like as this comes up to temperature. What'd you do for potatoes? Um, I have uh, red potatoes that I diced, and I always keep the skin on my potatoes because the, most of the nutrients is in the skin. Um, yeah. So I, there are people yeah, who really like can be a big deal about that, but I, I just, I, my mashed potatoes might be a little lumpy with the skin, but I, that's the way I do it. Yeah, I keep the skin on for most of the time. Um, we feel them this time because, you know, it's kind of weird when you just get like a floating skin without potato, but um, I respect your decision. <laughs> um lately we're getting like gourmet potatoes from the farmer's market like those little baby ones uh -huh. smashing you know boiling them crushing them a little bit and then either pan frying them or baking them with like oil rosemary garlic salt pepper i'm gonna put the lid on just to accelerate uh this get enough temperature and uh this is the time i would use um to start cutting up my peppers. It looks like you already did. But we can wax philosophical now if you like. <laughs> Maybe a before and after. So here is a red pepper, not cooked, not flamed. Here is a scorched red pepper that is not yet completely fallen apart. And uh, I did the same thing with poblano peppers, right? Poblanos, um, I find they take on smoke pretty nicely. Um, the smoky flavor I'm after. So that was not in the original recipe. And they too end up looking really flat and scorched. Um, I, if I don't have a grill or an open flame to put them on, I'd like, I'll just put these right on the flame if I have the option. But you can also put them in olive oil and roast them. Um, I don't like that one as much. I think it's harder to separate the skins. Uh, but they'll blister up similarly. But the trick in both cases is put them in a plastic bag. In this case, I use like a glass bowl that had a lid and I just keep all the moisture in and then it, as it cools and dries, it separates much more easily from the skin. So I'll usually do two or three red peppers and two or three poblanos. Don't yet know how using hardwood is gonna affect this. It's gonna make it more delicious. So the, right now I did a good job. Uh, the, the the charred skin's peeling right off. We'll just leave them the fleshy bits both behind. Um, I have sometimes had to fight these, and that's no fun. I just took a peek at mine, and uh, that orange broth just looks so good. Oh yeah. I have played with other spices uh, and herbs like rosemary, um, but I really like thyme the best uh, for this dish and just thyme. Um, towards the end though, we're gonna, um, per your desire, we also grew some chives. So we're gonna put some uh, little cut up chives on top of the plating. Yep, I cut some from my garden. Awesome. Yeah, no, I feel like uh, rosemary would overwhelm the dish. Yeah, it's too, it's too strong. Uh, time is a nice compliment. Any questions or objections on the professional front, the personal front, the cooking front? <laughs> uh, sort of secret disclosure that you probably didn't notice. But. What was the secret? The I mean, I you, you're talking about when there was a disembodied hand with a ring on it? Yes. Yes, I, I did actually comment on it, but I think that was the exact moment that the connection cut. Oh. <laughs> so I don't think you heard me at all, uh, but congratulations. Thank you. Cheers. So, uh, 
So when Actually, should they pay? Uh, unclear. Unclear. It's kind of been messing with us, but uh, I actually proposed in California uh, just after uh, RSA. I normally do my romantic bromance weekend with Jack Daniel up in Sonoma where we get some really good food and go to some, some vineyards. And uh, Jack was not around this year. So we yep. did the same photo shoot we did two years ago without Jack. Yep. It was funny. And one of the photo shoots I did two years ago was Jack took a photo of me and an Audi. Um, early in our relationship, I was reluctantly opening my heart again after uh, the blind side. And I felt whimsical. So in Sonoma Square, I gave her a piggyback ride uh, so she could be tall enough to smell the flowers very spontaneous and silly and i'm glad i didn't drop her and break her neck so this time as we reenacted all the jack josh photos without jack um, i'm like well we have to reenact the photo that jack took of us so while giving her an adult piggyback ride and trying not to drop her or my phone asked her a bunch of questions including do you want to spend your life with me do you want to marry me and I think her response was something like, uh, wait, are you really asking? <laughs> I said, yes, I'm really asking. And then she goes, are you really, really asking? And I said, yes, I'm really, really asking. So she said yes, and that was uh, leap day. But as we got home and looked at maybe doing a, a quick, small ceremony of sorts, uh, that's when COVID started hitting pretty hard. The dress store appointments closed and everything started closing so um so we are cautiously reapproaching some planning for something small and i'm very happy to have her in my life in this form and uh, i know several of you know her and uh she's not very public otherwise i'm sure she'd come on camera but uh it's been pretty awesome very different turn for life but it's pretty wonderful having somebody who knows our industry and knows the, knows the mission and uh, takes an active role in trying to make the world a safer place. You, know, you have a lot more common ground. She also makes sure I don't buy these herbs and vegetables, but we make as many as we can. So that's probably news to many. We tried to tell as many people as we could privately, but everyone's been tough to, to video chat with. So we did, uh, while, while you were uh, sharing that story, which by the way, um, I, I have to say, um, you never want the person to not know that you're actually asking them, like that shouldn't be the question <laughs> part, right? It should be the focus on, yeah, we want to do this. Uh, <laughs> um, have you ever used liquid smoke and a broiler to roast your peppers? I have not. Um, some people swear by liquid smoke. Um, for me, it just tastes funny. I mean, if I can't tell it's being used, then it's fine. But I've seen it used inartfully a lot. So maybe I have a an unfair hang up and I could give it another try. Um, it's just, it's, there's something just, same thing with artificial sweeteners. I just, they just, I can taste them. So yeah, uh, I'm, I'm the same way. Oh, you have? Okay. Artificial, Doesn't anything matter. artificial, I can, it, it overwhelms the, I, I, it, it jumps in and kicks my tongue and it's the first thing I taste. Um, I've never used liquid smoke and actually the idea of smoking this to begin with is something that Josh came up with this afternoon. Right. Um, that's That part was new so we haven't had an opportunity to try that but I personally will never use liquid smoke. Um, I use a, um, a commercial chef's um, smoker that you can use indoors and then right. you know, the, the big one outdoors just for summer. Um, and then for broiling them, um, I mean, you could broil them to blister them. That absolutely works. Um, same thing, you can actually do it also on a grill or a saute. Um, right. You just keep them balanced. The hard part for the saute is you just want to make sure you keep them balanced and like this, because it's less kind of like getting them sauteed and it's more just like getting the scorch on the, the skin. Yeah, evenly. So here's a moment of truth. This is the one I opened the top of before I smoked it. Let me see if it tastes at all smoky compared to the normal. How long did you smoke it? Um, not long. I would say probably at most 15 minutes. Yeah, I'm not getting a ton of smoke. This smells really good, dude. I'm happy. Yeah, I uh, 
but my my potatoes about, but, but, but potatoes need about 10 more minutes to cook. Okay. Yeah, you got to pay attention to those. I should have uh, looked at the time. I can also pluck one out and eat it. But so when the potatoes are, you know, they cook, they take longer to cook. But we're also going to add in the, the the white shoe peg corn. Now you could, don't have to use white shoe peg. I just find uh, it's nice. The, the the can I buy it in has no fluid in it, and it's a nice size and it holds up pretty well. And you know the skins aren't as hard but you can use any corn you want but um frozen corn giant brand is that what you're using yeah yeah i like white shoe peg for a different dish i make in the summer for like you have a cookout it's like a really spicy corn casserole with like diced chilies cumin cayenne paprika and cream cheese it's a uh, it's a really weird but awesome side dish for a barbecue. So that one really benefits from the white chew peg uh, as opposed to other kinds of corn. So I just kept using it here because I had it on hand. Yeah, corn has uh, been really scarce here in Northern Virginia. Um, typically we have just bushels of it always available in the store fresh and um, have not been able to get my hands on it regularly. Oh, tons of flavor or smell, aroma coming out. It's still not quite boiling. Um, so I'm gonna put this back on. We might do okay on time here. We might. So I like this uh, show concept. Um, how many episodes you done so far? Um, I think this is seven or eight. Okay. Are you uh, you gonna take weeks off in between, or maybe record some not live so you you don't have a your Wednesday taken every single week, or you love you loving it? Uh, if you look at the schedule, we are booked out through October. Okay. Every Wednesday. Um, the only thing that I change is um, for West Coast, I make it 7.30 p.m. Eastern time. Um, and then GrimCon is in two weeks, which is on a Wednesday and ends at 7 o'clock. So I pushed that one to 7.30. Um, so um, I could uh, fit it in with <laughs> the schedule I had of having to MC for eight hours straight. Okay. So that's going to be really exciting. For those of you who don't know GrimCon, this is the second time we're doing it. Um, we threw it together um, on two weeks of planning back in April when we realized everything was getting canceled and there was nothing available anymore. So we just wanted to put some content out. Um, I'd say the thing that makes it particularly special is we have a new speaker track. So folks who have never spoken or have not spoken a lot, uh, we pair them with a coach who helps them with their research and putting together their presentation before the, the con. So that scaffolding to help you know get over the imposter syndrome um, yeah. and put together a really good presentation with somebody dedicated to helping you deliver it. Um, and I just, I thought that was a really neat idea. Um, so that's something we're doing again. And I was thinking about trying to do something even like lower level than that um, for more like a Zoom happy hour with a few folks and bringing in people who sort of like, they had an idea, they, they, they wanted to see like how they could like go further with the idea. And they hadn't even gotten to the point of like, even coalescing to wanting to give a talk. Um, so, um, yeah, so July 15th. And then yep. we'll be cooking at 7.30 and the guest chef is Keenan Skelly. Okay. You know, that new speaker track, if we could double click on that for a second. Um, I love that, I'm all about that. Um, you know, it can be really tough for a new, uh, researcher or news presenter to, to get their first talk and uh, so I I do a lot of uh, assistance to folks that want help with their abstract or want to understand how does a CFP look at these or why didn't I get picked last year and they're all a little different but like if anybody wants that kind of help I'm I'm excited to do it I think we we really need to develop and extend the field of practice you know we're not exactly solving our cybersecurity problems we Josh. need more type of people I have an idea for this enthusiasm. 
Okay. So um, we've got a new speaker track lined up for the 15th. What if you keynoted the new speaker track highlighting all of those things that new speakers would be interested in? Hmm. Doesn't that take up a spot for a new person? Um, it does. Look, I'm happy to help any way you like, um, including but not limited to that. Um, but uh, I do think people have really important things to say. And I suffered from imposter syndrome for a long time. And I think I've seen it time and time again. In fact, well, this is not the reason I helped her. Um, uh, Audie's very first talk in public was at uh, um, Sky Talks. And she uh, was struggling with the submission and almost didn't submit. And I'm really glad that she did because it's very, very rare to have someone who comes from a clinical world that also understands hacking. And bring those two things together it was powerful. It was a very good talk. She went back again last year. Um, but like a lot of people think they either don't have something to add or they're not, you know, a egotistical rock star, you know, loudmouth. Um, <laughs> or that they don't have permission or they'll do it in a couple of years but like the best contributions we've had in the cavalry for this public safety mission have come from people you maybe never heard of right it's someone with a different perspective a different educational background a different frame of reference and they have a complement to what we already know and sometimes uh if you can help someone get past that imposter syndrome or get their first talk or get their confidence and their legs underneath them you can really add a lot, not just to their career, but maybe to the entire space we're all trying to, you know, allegedly trying to improve and advance. And just this morning, someone in our one of our Twitter DM groups was rewriting something for the biohacking village last minute, and I, I'm certain that after that conversation, it's it's certainly a talk I would want to go see, and maybe it always was. But um, I would love more established speakers taking others under their wing, even briefly, just to give for you know advice, not guide, not edicts but advice because you never know what you're going to get it may have a breakthrough all right given the time i'm going to i'm boiling now i'm going to add my shoe peg corn which you might already be doing but yeah hit me up after perhaps there's something we can pull together for like um you know tips for you know your first few you know cfps and conference talks um i might want to do it with someone i've recently worked with maybe so they could have like a both sides of the equation. Because I know what I offer, I don't know what resonates the most or what ultimately work the best for them because it's a personal style thing. But I'm 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 interested in talking about it. I, okay. I, I think it I think it's a, a good forum because we we've, we've created the space for it. Um so when yeah. is it again? July 15th. Okay. Well the good news is uh I'm, I'm, I think I'm free that day, but not for much after that. <laughs> All right, so just reminding people, if you were dying to add the meat back, don't yet, because now that we've got all this together, and the corn doesn't even have to cook yet for this part, but I'm gonna get a ladle. You can do corn raw. I've actually done some dishes with raw corn, and yep. it works, you just, it's, it's a particular flavor. Um, the texture, for the most part, is you know something you, you also need to think about a little bit because it's going to be a little crunchier. But um, I've worked with popcorn before. Oh, probably getting point to this. Well, particularly um, since we're going to be blending, we you can't blend meat. <laughs> that's right. Oh yeah, I never finished the thought. You can blend meat. I just don't recommend it. Don't blend meat. You've never had a meat milkshake. <laughs> Uh, no, <laughs> that's a thing. I don't know. It shouldn't be. If it is, it shouldn't be. It, yeah, it's yeah, I, think, I, think I think you're just messing with me. <laughs> All right. I'm going to make some noise for a second. So we got all that soup, all that flavor, but now it's creamy goodness creamy goodness not necessarily uh you know the same taste as dairy but a lot of the same feel and i'm adding it right back in and if you want it creamier you would have taken out more than i did 
I tend to like this pretty chunky, and sometimes if I'm in a hurry, I just make it as a Portuguese soup. But uh, it gave my kids the feeling and texture and general taste profile of a chowder without the, uh, the dairy and the stomach ache. Of course you can add butter and heavy cream. I usually add the heavy cream at the end per serving instead of uh, forcing it on everybody. And the one mistake I made, which I can live with for today, is I would have put the uh, diced up red and poblano pepper before I did the, the blender, but I forgot because I was talking. All right, you can always do more than one batch. That's right. But now that I've done the puree, I can add back this delicious set of sausage coins. And when it all gets up to temperature, just give it a little time to reheat that meat. Uh, you could basically serve it. Um, I think the flavors mellow a little bit better over a little more time. This is looking really tasty. Would you agree? Uh, and I'm trying to keep it to about an hour, which I think we're nearing that. We started a little late. Uh, now, as far as serving this, um, you can either just put this in a bowl and add the cream to that one person's, like a slow pour up top, make it look a little fancy. And then I'll put a few pieces of uh, snip chives, which we took out of our garden, on top. Um, you could also, uh, back to COVID time, the, the bakery did not have a lot of selection for me, but you could get um, a nice firm bread bowl uh, and carve out a bread bowl. Some people use sourdough. I kind of like a rosemary bread with this for some reason, even though I like the thyme in the soup, I like the rosemary in the bread. Uh, we couldn't find that, so we did get some rosemary bread and we're gonna cut it up into crostinis and to toast it a little bit for some texture. So maybe stick a little, uh, olive oil on it, maybe even sprinkle some garlic. Make a little uh, rosemary crostini crust in the top of the soup. Um, but we also did buy, and we might try this after we stop recording, um, we did buy a, a big, softer Portuguese loaf. That I don't think it's firm enough, but we might try to see that. It's usually a sweeter bread than I'm going after here. Oh wait, we have to plate something, don't we? Because you have to do the side by side. Yep. All right, let me see. You let me know when you're you're getting close to doing that so I can uh, be prepped. Although uh, I guess that was your cue, so we're we're getting there. <laughs> read the room, Bryson. Read the kitchen. Well, I think you're ahead of me on plating here, so. All right, I'm gonna opt not to use the heavy cream today. Get my chives. All right, so delicious uh, rosemary loaf, cut thin. I don't think I have time to toast it, but, or fire it. Mmm, smells good though. So uh, just a little mod that I made to this is I threw some uh, bay leaves in there with my stock. What's that? I, I threw some bay leaves in my stock. Oh, did you? Okay. It was a, it was a last minute idea. It just kind of spoke to me. Yeah. So you know, while we were prepping this, you made me type out the ingredients ahead of time, and I'm like, uh, "Hey, this is like an S bomb. Software building material, <laughs> right? Ingredients list for uh, for software, make it safer." You did not uh, just do that. You did not did. just do that. But think about it, man. Uh, the best chefs, what's what when they 
you know, of course, technique matters, of course, equipment matters. But what do they tell you? It starts with the finest of ingredients, right? Only the freshest and finest of ingredients. So, uh, did, did you know, Alan pay you to say that? Tell me, Alan paid you to say that. No, no, no. Now, I've been on this S bomb kick for, I don't know, seven, eight years now. Um, but, you know, I, I think I wrote the Rugged Software Manifesto almost 10 years ago, the idea that we're increasingly dependent on digital infrastructure, but it's not nearly as defensible as defendable and defensible as steel and concrete. You know, we rely on it, but it's not reliable. And AppSec programs alone weren't quite working. And most of the times we get hacked, it's because of some very old, very known vulnerability that was lurking that nobody knew about. So I'm hoping the act of transparency at least lets us know if we're including known vulnerable things at the time of creation. And when new vulnerabilities are discovered, we can tell am I affected or am I affected pretty quickly. Oh, that's that's looking like some good suit, man. There are that's no looking. vulnerabilities here. There, there's no vulnerabilities, okay? Okay. Look, It looks like some reliable suit. Chowder. Uh, so we, we've got some comments and questions. So uh, we have a birthday this weekend. So happy birthday. Happy birthday to you and to our country. Um, happy birthday. Um, I'm having a seafood fest. This seems like a great starter. What are your thoughts? Is it definitely a full meal or can it be used as a starter? Awesome question. So I have flirted with, um, if you guys are familiar with one of my favorite people on earth, Bo Woods, he will sometimes show me a, a, a photo of a, you know, a Southern boil that he'll make with corn on the cob and sausage and shrimp. Um, I have often thought that this dish could be a wonderful base to add uh, shrimp to. At some point, we're gonna be approaching a jambalaya or, or some other New Orleans dish, but whoever's thinking like seafood fest, I could absolutely see some extension to this. Um, it's got all the right precursor flavors for that kind of thing, especially if you up the garlic. Um, yeah, man, now I, now I want some shrimp. Yeah, no, I, think, I think this would really be up with some shrimp, like throw some shrimp in this. Um, Maybe try some additional seafoods. Like, I mean, you, you, you clearly wanted clams out of this because this really is kind of like clam chowder. So we're going back more toward that direction. But throw all that in there. And I mean, this is a cool meal. I could also see um, crab. I, I have made a roasted red pepper corn and crab chowder before. Um, so the right kind of crab could do it. Yeah, I, I like this idea a lot. Um, maybe even some oysters if uh, pre cooked properly. <laughs> we made oysters last week. <laughs> I know. <laughs> they were really good. Yeah. It made me uh, crave those uh, charcoal in the shell oysters down in New Orleans. Mm -hmm. Oh, it's nothing like those. All right, you pretty close to Platon? I've learned my, my lesson after burning myself last week. I uh, just thought of another herb that's also very common in gardens you could use with this is parsley. Yeah, I'm not a huge parsley fan, but um, I think I think that's a hang up of mine I should get over. Uh, we did buy some fresh parsley for our garden this year. Um, How do you have a hang up about parsley? What's, what's offensive about parsley? It's usually gross and just stuck on the plate by some restaurant. It's not used well, but when it's used well, it's good. Yeah, but you're using it. Think about what you could do. I'll have to try sometime. Look, when, with two teenage daughters, when they want food quick, they don't even want these fancy meals. They're like, Dad, why is it taking so long? And and with love, I tell them that I'm trying to make something nutritious and delicious for them. Uh, so I don't experiment when they're with me, but I, I do have some time to experiment elsewhere. Hey, I don't want to be repeat per, per se, but um, the best dish I make, I only make once a year at New Year's Eve. It's um, from scratch, a hot and sour soup, which is mostly an umami bomb of the likes of which you have never had in your life. And I've just got, it got to the point where I love hot and sour soup at restaurants, but like they all just kind of felt like they could be so much better. So I started experimenting with that and I think it's the best dish I make. It's it's not for everybody. You have to like mushrooms. Um, but uh, uh, that one takes me all day. And that's kind of when I started realizing this is a good stress relief. I would call people on New Year's Eve while cutting things 
and ask them like to reflect on their year like so what's the single you know biggest success you've had this year and what's one thing you'll change about yourself next year to be better and i'll usually call the three to five people that had the most profound impact on my life that year so they feel like it's a nice thank you i feel like it's to offer the, honor them and then at the end of it i'm like okay now you should call three to five people and you know by midnight hopefully quite a few people were thanked for their you know, memorable contributions uh, in that person's life Are we, oh wait we got a whole bunch more questions wait let's see oh um i love that seafood idea uh they have dungeness crab and alaskan king crab legs and shrimp and oysters because of course they're ready for a seafood fest so that sounds awesome yeah um it is a great ad and we agree i'm into the parsley blah all right well i thought they were going my way but they, they, uh. they, they, that's fine <laughs> And then, uh, uh, but we got somebody else who came back on my side. How do you not add parsley to everything and paprika, which smoked paprika would be a really nice addition to this. Yeah, so we, we didn't get into why I pick um, the, the chorizo or the chadis, depending on who you're asking. Uh, there's some nice smoky paprika in it. There's also some cayenne. So I get enough of it out of the way I cook the meat, but if I'm feeling feisty and my kids aren't around, like they're not tonight, I would add some cayenne and some smoked paprika. Um, I love me some cayenne. I, I think you, you recently had this, right? This is possibly uh, one of the few people who likes hot food more than me. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but yeah, I just don't, I don't always turn it up for when I'm making a large amount of food because not everybody likes it the same way I do. But. All right. Any other questions? Uh, no, just uh, more anger at the parsley. So let me know when you're ready to plate. Who, who realized parsley was so polarizing? It's like it's like the pineapple pizza of. Uh, I I did not see that coming. All right. So I'm I, adding a bunch of you know, uh, like dice. Oregano. I know there's people who I mean not oregano, uh, cilantro. I know there's people like that really issue with cilantro. Oh, I love my cilantro. I know the first time I ate it, it tasted like soap, but never again. Uh, yeah, cilantro is amazing. If you don't like cilantro, how do you make like chimichurri, steak sauce? Well, there's this, this parsley and chimichurri. So, all right, there's an exception. I like the parsley and chimichurri. <laughs> At least have a common ground on that. All right, you let me know when you're ready. Okay, so I have toasted a slice of rosemary bread. I've added my diced chives on top to my dish. Problem is the camera is really high. Perhaps my fiance could bring the camera down. Ouch. Hold on. No, nope. fine. Right. We can bring the food up as long as we don't get my laptop. Oh, All right, you guys are close with it. Any better? We has food. Yes. Ready? Boom. No, hey, yours is pretty good. You got a hold lot more yellow than I did. That's nice though. No, yeah, put the put it back. I didn't take the shot. Oh, well, we have to, have to take the, the shot. I think the the bowl is quite hot, so give us one. Yeah, that's here. why I put. A, that's why I'm wearing a a glove. <laughs> All right, let's not spill. All right, do you see there the dish? Up oh, a little this way. Oh, stop! Bam! Got it. Uh, this is the hardest part of this is I want to eat it. Eat it. Try it. I just tried some. It's delicious. You're making me want to try the chorizo again. I I tried it once and didn't go back just because it was a pretty overpowering flavor, but maybe I could have fixed that a different way. Mine is not overpowering. Um, mm. But I also I used uh, three leeks instead of two, um, two onions as well. Uh, and um, I can't really say how much, how many <laughs> potatoes I ended up using because I prepped a lot more than I could actually fit. So I adjusted, um, and then I, I rendered a heavy cream by slow cooking milk down um, to put it in, which also helps kind of you know blend the flavor. Um, mm. but the only thing I'm gonna do when I serve this after is I'm gonna put a little olive oil on the crostini instead of just toasting it. Mm, pretty good. Yeah, it's great. I love it. 
I know we had some complications, but did you plug our charity for the evening? Um, our charity for the evening for um, is Cyber Jutsu, uh, supporting women and girls coming into cybersecurity. Um, Josh will match a pool up to five hundred dollars. We realized that the late in the game, that uh, the donations may have uh, a minimum amount, and we will try to figure that out. If you'd like to donate and can't meet that minimum amount, um, talk to me later, and we'll see if we can do a bulk uh, donation to them. But um, I met the founder of this right around the time I was founding I Am the Cavalry, and uh, very supportive of the idea. If you guys all know Chris Hoff or Beaker, he he started the first Hack Kid Con up in Boston, and where all of our children went and learned hacking fundamentals and things like that. And I think part of the cure for our lack of diversity inclusion in our underrepresented minorities right now is we have to invest in it at early ages. So uh, what's interesting about this group is while it was initially focused on women in, in STEM and tech, um, they have now a child fund as well or initiative on uh, kids. So um, I think it's a good idea. It's going to pay off uh, now and later but also potentially mentoring opportunities. So sorry about the snafu on how to donate, but um, it's one of the many good initiatives uh, trying to help dampen our cultural issues and blind spots. I know the cavalry has benefited significantly from non-traditional teammates and uh, it, you know, it's not an obligation, it's an opportunity. And uh, I think more of us should look at it like that. Well, Josh, thank you for coming on the show and helping us make this delicious poblano, or we'll just call it a um, chili pepper. Smoky chowder. chowder. Smoky chowder. Smoky chowder. Yeah. I am the chowder. <laughs> All right. I look forward to seeing you in person, and let's talk about your uh, your your new speaker track. I'm I'm keenly interested. Sounds good. All right. Good night, everybody. <laughs>